Yeah. Um, so, so why did you make this movie? I mean, like. <clears throat> Well, that's I mean, a bit yeah. of a story, but before we jump into that story, we, we have to acknowledge some people that are here because this was a this was an incredible team effort, and we were thrilled to be able to work with local talent from right around here in the making of this film. So uh, there are a number of people I just want to point out and have them stand, including our star Annie Fabian. Woo! Where is she, Annie? Stand up. Um, our production supervisor and associate producer, Catherine Van Hengel. Catherine. Um, our ace camera assistant, Brandon Sargent, who helped set up many of those complex rigs that were required. And uh, production consultant, Sabina Barak. Sabina, are you here? Yeah. <laughs> Am I forgetting? All I know is that probably about half of the people in this audience helped us make this film Absolutely. in some form or another. Yes, and we received generous support from the community and many people in this room. Without it, this would have never happened. So we're incredibly grateful for that. And I know two other people I want to thank our graphic designer and Clara Young. Oh. <laughs> and, and daughter. Our son, Walker Young, who was a stand-in, and he is a great grass cutter. If you didn't know it, that was him, that was him cutting the grass. And it's really our kids who were the inspiration for this movie, uh -huh. we have to say. This is something that Susan and I have been thinking about, I think, for at least 15 years. It really started with this book that we read um, called uh, by Richard Louvre called Last Child in the Woods. And it was, this book is uh, it's a marvelous book. And he's since gone on to make, to uh, write uh, two more books about this. He's a, he's founded this organization called Ch uh, Children and Nature Network. And his findings were that kids these days with cell phones and iPads were not going out in the woods and are not going out in the woods in the same way that people in our generation did when we only had three television stations and you know, our mom or dad could turn off the television and say, get outside. So um, I think when Andy and I were sitting around the dinner table, we would think, God, we gotta do something about this. There's so much amazing nature outside uh, that's so important to learn about because unless you learn about nature, and really experience it firsthand, you don't care about it. You know, it's just out there. But that, so that was the goal of the film. Yeah. So, like, on the one hand, it was I ironic because we were getting these assignments as filmmakers to go document nature in these far flung places like Madagascar and uh, Alaska. Mm -hmm. And then we would come home, you know, just to decompress between jobs, and we would see these amazing things right out the window. And we would often wonder, well, how come? Nobody's paying attention to this. And there was this ever-present uh, feeling that was projected on television that nature only exists far away from here. You know, you have to travel to the other side of the globe to be somewhere pristine and exotic. And, and while where we live is not pristine, it certainly can be exotic when you get up close and really see it. And so I think we started to get this idea, like we have to tell this story that nobody else is really telling, which is the, the amazing beauty that's right beneath our feet. And, and then our, our daughter inspired us with this amazing cartoon that she drew. She's an artist. And she, she drew this cartoon of a girl playing a video game. And her mom is like nagging in the background saying, you have to go outside. And so then the next frame shows that the girl has set up her video game outside. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we sort of, you know, looked at what, what society is giving the younger generation today and kind of comparing that to the growing up that Susan and I had where we were both running around, you know, catching things in our backyards. And it was, it was just a very different dynamic, not because of the kids, but because what we've given to them, the world that we've created for them. And uh, we sort of felt like this was a conversation that needed to take place. And we wanted to make a film that inspired people to have that conversation. 
And so, you know, once you decided to make this film, I mean, this is like an easy film to make. You just set up a lot of cameras outside and see what emerges. And so, yeah. Actually, actually, making natural history films, which this is primarily, that's what this genre is called, is probably one of the most difficult kinds of filmmaking to do because you're, you're counting on the seasons, and you're counting on the weather, and you're also counting on the animals, and it's so, so difficult. In fact, right now, you're experiencing the, the early part of the film. The <clears throat> spotted salamander migration happened probably about two or three weeks ago. Um, we've got uh, courtship behavior going on with wood ducks. They're looking for nests right now. Some of them are even finding their nest. And when you think this film took three years to make, it's because it was really hard to be in, on top of each one of those things happening as it, as it, as it so occurred. It, and they all happen at night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this time, in the rain. <laughs> I think this, this week, two years ago, we were completely strung out because of all the things that were happening, and it's like you have- Was this the Wood Duck Week uh, uh, two years ago? The, well, the, no, the Wood Duck Week was actually a little bit later, uh -huh. but you know, we were sort of in between uh, salamanders and wood frogs and trying to make sure that we were catching the leaves coming out. It's unbelievable how making a nature film can be so stressful. <laughs> I mean, I remember when you were, I, I remember the Wood, du the wood Duckling yeah. you know, episode, and it, maybe you could talk about that. Well, generally what happens is that one egg starts to open up and hatch the night before or the day before, and it usually takes, you know, a, a day for all the other ones to get ready and all the ducklings to come out. And then generally they launch the next morning somewhere between like 6 and 11 o'clock six in the morning to 11 o'clock. And we were actually um, uh, featuring this live for schools and colleges to follow. And it, it happened to be a school day. So we were also trying to get Claren Walker off at school in the morning, which I think they can probably tell you what that day was like. Uh, but uh, we waited and waited and waited and they actually started I think at 11 o'clock. That's what, so it was a little bit later than normal. But you know these things only happen once a year, and so yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's one why it, it, it's it's one unbelievably day. stressful. And so a number of the scenes were contributed to in little pieces over a period of, of mm -hmm. three years or so. One other thing I want to say about the way we shot this, as you can tell um, from the some of the making up footage, is uh, while a good deal of it was shot in the wild with wild animals, we also used captive animals. And one of the things that we learned is that if you if you start visiting wildlife rehabbers, you get a much more complete picture of the impact of humans uh, living in this forest. Because everywhere there are large quantities of displaced animals. Or sometimes the animals have increased in numbers you know, because of our activities. But there's this enormous fallout from uh, our presence here. And um, so you go there and you just see endless cages of animals that have been uh, displaced or removed from people's homes, you know, many times these animals are pests. In fact, we purposefully chose animals that many people consider to be pests. But we looked at the rehabbers as being an opportunity and those animals as being potential ambassadors of their kind. And so we worked with people who had animals that were going to be releasing them, mm. uh, or in cases like Marguerite the Blue Jay were unreleasable and we're, we're used to humans. And uh, so we often worked with those kinds of animals and built sets and just made sure that everything that we were doing was based in scientific fact. But we also knew that in, if we were gonna make an appealing film about animals that were so common, we had to put the audience in places that, that we were, you were never gonna be and to experience them in a more intimate way than we normally do, and that required doing special things. Mm. I mean, and and you also, I mean, you're you're people who actually um, have tracked for years things going on on your property. I mean, you had a beaver cam when you found beavers on the property that went that people could actually chime into yeah. and watch for for several years. Uh, yeah, we we lived we've lived uh, in that house uh, for about uh, twenty years. And we actually moved and built that house on the property because of the pond. 
-hmm. I think we were both, when we saw the, the, the property and saw the, the kinds of plants that were there, because at that point I'd been always very interested in native plants. There were certain kinds of ferns, maidenhair ferns, that were growing wild there that I hadn't seen before except in garden centers. So I, I was very taken by the, the property. And I think as we um, lived there and got more involved in uh, environmental organizations in the community, like um, the Croton Arboretum and Westchester Land Trust and other places that we've been involved with, uh, we started to really appreciate things. And we, we saw we had a vernal pool that had, and we, got, we didn't know what a vernal pool was when we first moved out here, but you know, it, it's that kind of thing you start to appreciate and you realize just how biologically rich Westchester and this, you know, the whole Eastern Forest really is. We've got more people now living in the Eastern Forest of the United States than we ever have had before. And there's actually, there's a, one of the statistics I remember is there, there's more people actually living in closer proximity to nature in this area than in any other area of the, United, in, uh, of the world. Right? And yeah. at any other time in human history, which right. seems impossible, mm -hmm. but impossible. if you think about uh -huh. the population density is mm -hmm. so high, uh -huh. and there actually are animals here too. So back you know, when, when humans first kind of came to North America, the population density was very low. There were tons of animals, but the human population was very low. Now the human population density is through the roof, and there actually are a lot of uh, animals in suburban areas, and so that's kind of where the, the clash is. But, you know, I wanted to say one other thing, too. You mentioned the beaver camp. Um, a lot of the stuff that we did was really influential to what we ended up doing with this, because um, when, um, you know, we had this beaver family move into a lodge just down the hill from our house, and, and I was like, oh, you know, should I do something? Should I try to put a camera there? And Susan was just like, stop talking about it and just go do it. And you know, I was so worried about, you know, disturbing their, their world down there. And of course, then I learned that, you know, people try to dynamite them and they keep coming back. And so I was like, okay, the hell with it. I'm going to put the camera up. And once we got a, a camera in there, which was not easy, but um, I, I became completely sucked into their world. I mean, it was like I was addicted to, it was like The Office or something. You know, I was watching this, this sitcom of these animals that lived under this pile of mud and sticks until she was like, you know, would you get off of that? And... No, he, yeah, he had it on his cell phone. I would, he, he, he was he would sit up. It would be like two in the. It would, it would bing. So it would like go bing in two in the yeah. morning. And we'd sit up. And go, oh, they're doing that. And I'm like, God, put the phone down. Well, usually so. I was paranoid that they were going to bury the camera with mud, which which they which did, happened, which yeah. happened, and would cause you know a huge amount of work to get it back working again. But uh, the kids probably remember on some occasions we would actually be sitting around the dinner table eating. And I would tune in the beaver lodge on the iPhone, and the beavers would be eating too. And, and so we would kind of set up the phone there, and they'd be munching on their little tubers and sticks, and we'd be eating our food. And, and that was when it, it kind of dawned on me that these creatures... That's when you know you need help. Yeah. <laughs> but that these creatures were, were essentially occupy the same space, but we're almost living in completely different universes. Yeah. And, you know, their world, just 100 feet down the hill, and all of the things that were going on, the catfish that would come in mysteriously into the mm. beaver lodge, and the frogs that would take refuge there in the dead of winter when everything else was frozen, they were swimming around, and all kinds of amazing stuff we saw down there. And it just kind of blew my mind what was going on that we're just not even aware of. And, you know, so close to us, just living, you know, in the gutter, in the, you know, in the eaves of your house, there's a whole other world of drama going on. And so I think what we wanted to do with Backyard Wilderness is bring a little bit of that to people. And, and doing that kind of dictated doing it in, you know, strange ways. But, but that was the goal, really, with the whole thing. And I think also, if everybody should know, this film is playing all over the world right now. Mm in museums and science centers. It's, uh, it's in Stockholm. It's opening in Saudi Arabia. It's in, gonna be in Beijing, you know, in Mexico City. And it's in about 30 theaters uh, all across the United States and Canada right now. So it's, uh, it's, it's been really well received by people. And it is accompanied by 
a full-on educational outreach that you can all download online. It's uh, If you go to Backyard Wilderness Film, uh, we've got a family activity guide. We've got curriculum in Spanish and English uh, for teachers. So if you are interested in this, you can tell the the supervisor of science in your schools that they can they can start using this. They can go see the film. Uh, it's been at the American Museum of Natural History uh, in New York. It's at Liberty Science Center, New York Science Center, uh, New York Hall of Science, uh, Maritime Aquarium, uh, and it's the kind of thing where you can go on um, field trips and go see the film and then go back to your classrooms. And for, I mean, one one of the things also people say is like, well. Gosh, you're trying to get your kids off the kids off the cell phones, but then you have all the cell phone stuff that's in the in the movie of her taking pictures and you know tweeting and Instagramming. And I think one of the things we feel is like there's technology is is great. It is not a bad thing. I think what we have to watch out for, and what's so hard is that it's so addictive. And you can just get to the point where you can't get off of it because it's just so, you know, you feel like you got to be on it all the time. And that's with adults and kids. And I think kids really need to know that there is a balance that you got to find in your lives about uh, how much you learn, how much you use your cell phone. And we wanted to show that there are positive ways to use your cell phone and technology. And for the film, we've uh, created an app. It's called Seek, S-C-E-K. And it's based off this big app uh, called iNaturalist, which is a citizen science app so that you can kind of participate and contribute to science and the collection of science. And I have there's a little leaves out on the table out there that say uh, the information about Seek. And on those leaves are wildflower seeds. So you can take that home and then you can plant that in your garden, you can grow some wildflower seeds. But it's it's super fun, it's just like a scavenger hunt yeah. with pictures. And it works anywhere in the world. If, if, you're, it, if you're in yeah. Rotterdam, it shows you what the most common plants are and animals are in Rotterdam. And so it's super fun, it's been the number one app in over 40 countries for ages nine through 11. So. Let's take some let's take some comments and questions from the audience. I mean, what, what what really comes off is your unbelievable love of animals in this film. I mean, in like you're totally fearless Even about it. Just like, it, I mean, just like it's just so, so fantastic. <laughs> oh, so great. Actually, we have um, gerbils now. We don't have mice anymore. In in the back. Yeah. Hi. Is this on? Okay. So. Um, nice to see Croton in, in, in a film again, the uh, first one since Reds maybe, but uh, uh, two things. So CGI, is, I don't you know, how much is that of that is there in this film that you have to use for it? And then what's the backstory behind the uh, Free Fall and Tom, Tom Petty song? Um, so CGI, which is, uh, stands for Computer Generated Imagery, uh, is really sort of making something that isn't there from scratch in a computer. And um, that was only used once in the movie, uh, which is the, the tree falling against the uh, power line. Um, yeah, everything else is real. All the animals are real. Uh, there are Hollywood techniques. Probably the most uh, common one would be compositing, where you take uh, real things, but and you you add them together in layers, and we needed to do that, like where you have animals doing something in the foreground and the actors doing something in the background. There's just no way, you know, talk about hurting cats. That <laughs> this would be hurting raccoons and actors at the same time. It's just not going to happen. And so uh, we did those things in separate elements and combined them together. However, the behavior of the animals is all real, or at least responding to real things and presented in a way that was, you know, thoroughly vetted by scientists. So it's all real animals and, and for the most case, real behavior, um, but we had to sort of use the, the movie craft to, to sort of bring it all together in a magical way. And as far as the free falling is concerned, um, I don't know, when we first sat down and started editing that scene, that song was just in my head. And, and I was like, is this too over the top? And I cut it together. People were like, 
yeah, I don't know. And, but then all of a sudden our distributor was like, well, okay, that's cool if you can get it. And then we were lucky enough to have the Howard Hughes Medical Institute come on board as, as one of our funders. And um, the head of the Tangle Bank Studios, which is their film division, because they do lots of science education, he's a huge Petty fan. And so when he heard that we were considering that, he was like, you have to get that. <laughs> and, the, and the strange thing is, is that we, we had kind of had a verbal agreement with him and his manager, and then he passed away. Uh, you know, before we had actually like had a contract or a license or anything. And, but, you know, thankfully it all went forward. And, you know, we feel like it's a gift uh, actually to have that in the film. Over here. Um, how did you film the scene where the coyotes are chasing the deer? That's a really good question, and we, we get that a lot, too. So um, this was something that was inspired by stories that we heard from a couple of different people in Westchester who had actually seen coyotes chasing deer. Um, so we know, including a biologist, so we know that it happens, and we actually have a coyote den in the woods back behind our house, although we could not get anywhere near it with a camera without the coyotes moving off. They're unbelievably skittish. So again, we had to use some Hollywood magic to make that happen. Um, and we worked with um, rehab animals. Again, there was a, a litter of coyote pups that were rescued from someone's, uh, you know, someone actually called an exterminator to have them removed from their property and we got a call from a rehabber who had these, these uh, coyote pups um, that needed a home. And so we found a, pl uh, a great place up in the Adirondacks that rehabilitates wildlife. And the coyotes went there, and they actually had a, a surrogate coyote mother who could be their mother. And so we built a den, and we basically created a natural environment for them to grow up that also allowed us to film them. And uh, we created a big enclosure in the forest where we were able to get them running around. And so they were actually done separately from the deer. Um, and the deer, were, some of it was filmed in the wild and some of it was filmed in a huge uh, research facility in Pennsylvania where they kind of moved the deer from one pasture to another and there were all kinds of opportunities to get shots of the deer uh, running and jumping, and so it, it was completely constructed, um, but based very much on the descriptions of what we had heard people say. And the actual deer that you see dead was, was not actually killed by the coyotes. That was a, a roadkill. That was deer that we found, a deer that we found on the side of the road, and you know, not wanting anything to go to waste, we, we used it for that shot. The, the coyotes actually got to eat that deer, and then we had another roadkill deer, because there are many, which we attached, um, which we put down on the ground on our property and with a time-lapse camera and let it sit for six months and filmed it over a six-month period. And, and there were lots of frames of our dog that we had to take out, <laughs> kind of rolling in the coyote, come back like incredibly stinky. And it was just a nightmare. So there was all kinds of things that, that uh, go into making a film like this that you can, can imagine. Can I ask you a question about that? Because you really had to stick to your guns about the, the decomposition of the, of the deer. And yes. that was a really important thing. And I'm just curious if you could talk about that for a moment as to why some people some of the theaters didn't want that in. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, well, the museums and science centers that show the film uh, are, they bring in school groups, and it's, the film really has to be suitable for ages, you know, four to 94. So uh, we have to be careful not to um, upset kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think our first screenings of the film, we had, that that image of the deer composing, and it was uh, it was raw. You know, we didn't have any. It was just like that deer, six months, yeah. guts, everything. And some of the people we showed it at one of the giant screen conventions prior to releasing it, and they said, "We're not going to be able to show that. You have to do something about it. You have to take that shot out." And um, we were like, "Oh, we can't take that out. That's such an important thing. It's like this is like." you know, like death going back into the earth and growing up again. So we did some serious um, uh, masking and 
took took the color out of it and you know put leaves up made leaves come down and sort of obscured the the gory part of it and hopefully it didn't disturb anybody here um yeah what one of the things that works you, that you d can't tell from this even though it, 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 this is a great way to see it when you watch it on an imax screen you know that is literally uh, six stories tall, or whatever they are, it it you know it's really huge, and you you can't even see the edges of the screen. You're inside it, and so the details of that were much closer to us. And the reaction of the theaters was, you know, if the deer dies, we're not taking the movie. And we were like, well, wait a minute, you know, we can't we can't just have this. The de and the deer dies in Bambi, we, you know, <laughs> please, you have to let us uh, have the deer die um, because otherwise, it's not about life. So it was really up to us to figure out how to make it something that they could tolerate. And I think everybody's happy with it now. We just had Very to effective. soften yeah. it a little bit, that's all. Yeah. And I, I know and the other thing I want to say is, you know, there's so much animation out there with animals. I mean, you've got the Lion King coming out with this like super realistic animation. Uh, kids are seeing uh, animals talking in, in on cartoons and the TV shows all the time. And we felt it was really important to try to make something that was real. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we want to do more stuff like this yeah. because I think that it, it brings you into contact with, um, with, the, with the lives of the creatures that we share the planet with. One other observation, too, is that in, in watching this film, it's never the kids that get upset with these things. It's their parents. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, thank you for a beautiful film. Um, my question is about bears. I know uh, like 15, 20 years ago, they used to tranquilize them and take them back to the Catskills, and now we live with them. I had one in my backyard a couple of weeks ago. I live near T-Town, and yeah. the bear travels through the neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering if you had considered uh, filming bears now that we're living with them here. We certainly did. Um, th they were still maybe a little bit too much off the charts. I, I mean, I, they're definitely coming. You know, uh, we're. I mean, we're we're the ch we're going to see lots of changes. I'm sure. If I, I think about how much things have changed since I was a kid, I ho almost never saw a deer. You know, I grew up in Chappaqua. I remember being incredibly excited once seeing a deer cross the road. Now it's like you have to honk to get them off the road. Um, and the same thing with the beavers. And we've got. Tons of bobcats in Westchester. You know, the, the, these are changes that are happening. It's a very dynamic situation due to you know our our creation of suburbia and our destruction of predators and various other things. And so the bears, I believe, are going to increase just like the coyotes are. Um, we didn't put them in the film because they were sort of too exotic at this moment in time, and so we wanted to kind of stick to things that we felt more people were likely to see in their own backyards. But, but absolutely, they're part of the landscape. And there's a whole raft of complicated issues that are happening because of this situation. And we didn't, obviously, we don't touch on that, but it is a whole other topic of conversation. I mean, coyotes are actually not natural to this area. They're, they've moved in, they've invaded, although wolves did used to live here. And, um, you know, on the one hand, we've got a predator now where, you know, we, we eliminated a predator, but it's also something that a lot of people are very uncomfortable with. And so it raises lots of questions about what kind of world do we want to create for ourselves and what kind of world do we need, you know, to have a balanced planet. So it's very complicated. Also, you're, you're kind of asking a question, too, that it's about selection. Why do we choose the animals that we, choose, that we chose for the film? And part of it was we wanted to have uh, enough of the interconnected ecosystem. So everything from, you know, the coyote down to the ladybug and to the caterpillar, because our whole system here is really dependent on insects. Uh, we've got to have those caterpillars and in order to feed the next generation of uh, blue jay chicks and other other uh, animals. So one of the things that you all can do, and this is this is straight from the heart, you can go out and you can look at the plants and animals that are planted in your backyard, and you can start planting the kinds of an the kinds of plants that animals need. You can start planting more of the native species 
you can start planting more of the flowers that butterflies and insects need. And you can make a big difference because your backyard is connected to somebody else's backyard. So it's like we can make a big wave of change just by what we're planting in our backyards. And it's a bit challenging because the deer are you know, overpopulated and can eat a lot of things, but there are, there are lots of things to select from. And I know T-Town's having their plant sale coming up, and also the Native Plant Center uh, just in a couple weeks is having their, their big sale. And that, those are great fun places to learn. A question over here. What type, of, what type of camera would you recommend if someone else would like to film something like this? Oh, wow. That's a great question. You know, We're you looking for interns right now. Yeah. So you, you're um, coming up. You're you can actually up. start with just about anything, including like a phone. Um, I, people have gotten amazing pictures of nature, even just with uh, their phone or, or simple cameras. The cameras that we use are, are pretty expensive, um, but, but there are great places to start. Um, because this movie was is really designed to show on this enormous screen, we need a camera that has a huge amount of resolution. But even the stuff that's on your phone these days um, is capable of capturing very detailed images. So please jump in and start taking pictures. I think that's absolutely the best thing you can do, is start telling stories about the things that you're seeing. Do you, do you have a camera at your house? Do you have a video camera? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you need to need to grab it and start playing around with it and this read, is a read the directions. A great time of year to go out and start documenting things. I actually think, and that's why the Seek app also is cool because it's not passive; it's active. So you're actually going out and finding things, and it's augmenting the experience by telling you what they are. And it involves taking a picture, and then you you have a record. You can keep things over time. Uh, I think that's the the best way for. Uh, it's a great way for young people to begin engaging with uh, the wonderful world of nature. And you can also draw. Yeah. It's one of the things that's really important, I think, about uh, understanding and learning about nature is to take your time because it's hard to see animals. I mean, did you know that raccoons had uh, their babies inside trees like that in holes? A lot of people don't, yeah, yeah. That, a lot of people don't. You could have in your yard right now, there could be raccoons. Uh, having their babies. Yeah. Um, and the, the things that happen, I think, with um, drawing, when you're out drawing with a, with a sketch pad, is that you start to really look with your eyes and you start to smell things and you start to hear things. You start using all your senses because one of the great things about being in nature is that it kind of slows us down in a very, very healthy way you start to use your whole brain and your whole body and understand things. Uh, and then you can go back and you can look in a book about what that animal was or see if you can even figure out what that plant was. And that, that, those knowing plants and knowing the names of plants and the names of birds and the names of uh, the animals in your backyard, that is so valuable. And there's another disturbing statistic that the average 10-year-old knows about 300 consumer brands but can only name about 10 of the, uh, the native plants and animals in their backyard. Yep. Just a couple more questions here. She has the, the mic. How many animals? Oh. I hear you. Sure. How many animals? <laughs> I hear you. How many animals did you... Um, how many animals did you use to make this film? They were just three. They were wearing different costumes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, that's a great you, question. You, I've you lost count. count. You got to count them, yeah. Yeah, there were lots of those little um, salamander babies, so I would lose count pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and last question here. Um, I want to applaud you guys. Uh, I really appreciate what you've done. I've been connecting people with local nature for most of my life, and um, the Spotted Salamander is, is the logo that I've chosen mm. um, for, for my company. Wow. And uh, 
I'm in the schools all the time, and in the schools and on television, we're constantly connecting people with faraway places. Yeah. And I love mm -hmm. to go to faraway yeah. places, but I fell in love with nature in the vernal pool in my backyard in Darien, Connecticut. And so right. um, the amphibians are really important to me, and unfortunately, they're the ones that often people don't value or devalue, right. and they're the least favorite of most, of many people. And when we're children, it's often our favorite. And so I'm really concerned about when that switch is flipped to, I loved it, but now I don't like it anymore. And unfortunately, I see it a lot in the schools where it's, it's unfortunately the adults that are flipping that switch. Um, and so I, I applaud you guys for A, doing what you've done for, for local nature, and I think I'm already seeing some of the impacts of your film because I talk about squirrels and chipmunks planting seeds, and of course we're all trying to plant the seeds of, you know, in these children to be good, better stewards to the earth. And squirrels and chipmunks are doing this, and I've had kids say, well, blue jays are too, you know? <laughs> and, and so I, I, I and, and I never had thought about the Blue Jays doing that, uh, but I had certainly watched squirrels and chipmunks doing it since I was a child. Nobody taught me that, right. but I observed that in nature, and, and now you're showing kids that, and, uh, right. and I'm hearing quite a few kids that are, are commenting about that, and I was wondering, right. where are you children learning this from? You know, and I wasn't able to get an answer from a child yet where they saw that, but I knew it was coming from somewhere, and I think it's coming from you. <laughs> the so. Maritime Aquarium, where we yeah. showed for about a year, so we reached a lot of kids that way. And I, I thank you so much for your comment. I mean, that is so much of why we did this. And, it's, and amphibians are the things that kids love, and they're so accessible, and they're so important to our environment. And yet, like Susan, who was on the, the planning board for many years of our town, would uh, constantly hear proposals for filling in wetlands and, you know, for making new housing projects, subdivisions, and, and would have to go up in front of these people and talk about the biodiversity of these places and why they actually matter. Um, and so it does make a difference to, to bring this stuff up. I think it has to do with like they're, they're sort of slimy feeling, and people think they're slimy. And then everybody, everybody likes cute baby fluffy things. You know, cute baby rabbits, cute baby raccoons. We are we all we have an affinity for like cute baby animals. Salamander's cute. I think the salamander's cute too. But I'm just <laughs> saying I, that's where I think that the your your the switch comes. But it matters how we representing that to children. And yeah. What I'm representing to children is that they're all beautiful, life is beautiful, it's mm -hmm. precious, and all life matters. And if we help the kids to see the value in that. Spotted salamander babies eat mosquito larvae. Yeah. Snakes eat mice and rats, which carry ticks and fleas, which carry disease. If we can help the kids to see the value and see the beauty in all living things, then it won't just be the bunny rabbit, because the kids easily say in my programs, I love the chinchilla the most. <laughs> yeah. That doesn't make you unique, you know. Um, let's love life. And so uh, this, this I, I, I would also like to know, is this accessible to teachers, and maybe not yet, but in video form, will it s at some point be accessible so that this video could be seen? Um, you know, but uh, I want to promote this this right. this to many teachers because they're teaching about faraway places. We can't love what's in somebody else's backyard, in my opinion, in a real honest to goodness way, unless unless we love what's in our own backyard. And no, and many people have no clue, which is what this movie addresses, because this drama is playing out, you know, in, in so many people's backyards, and we are part of that habitat, but the kids don't see it that way, because a lot of the adults don't either. We're yeah. not looking into the fishbowl, we are in that fishbowl, mm -hmm. and we're having an impact, positive Thanks. and negative. Well, Thank actually, all the, all the kids in the audience right now have a chance to participate in a really big way by telling museums and people that are going to watch this film, what you liked about the film and what you learned about the film. Because we, we actually have, uh, we're going to do like a little video promo, and it's going to be out outside of the theater. We'd like to interview any kid that is interested in telling us what they thought about the film, and that can hap that's going to happen right after this. We have a a, a, a video crew right out. Yeah, it's Ka you can meet yeah. up with Catherine. It's only going to take a few minutes to, to say what your favorite part was. Uh, any young people that want to do that, 
This will help spread the word to other institutions. And it still plays uh, at the Maritime. School groups can still go there and, and talk to us afterwards about other opportunities. It, it, it probably yeah. will yeah. be available in video uh, in a couple of years. Yeah. Right now, this, the, the museum run is kind of an exclusive run. But there are lots of, um, with the educational outreach, there's lots of things that are, that are part of, that people can see. I think that's actually a perfect, perfect place to. And you, you have to, another whole week to see it here, so tell all your friends. <laughs> so it's a perfect place to transition. I mean, thank you so much. Congratulations. And right. any of the kids who want to participate, I mean, really, that sounds like a great episode. Yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the film. You can tell our, our camera crew about it. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.